Good morning to the community of faith that has gathered in the name of Christ Jesus on this Sunday. It is good to be with you, to be with people who are striving to put love first in all things. It is our mission. It is what we are trying to achieve, not only as a community, but to work on it as individuals, because there are those places in life where love comes easy, and then there are those places where we have to work. And it's good to practice and to find those that will encourage us and pray with us, to find tools that will help us to be a people who can put love first in all things. If you are visiting with us this morning, we really consider it a blessing that you are a part of this community of faith. And our hope is is that you experience the goodness and grace of God, that you walk out of this place saying, I am a beloved child of God. I want to remind you of those blue cards that you find in your worship guides this morning. Please fill them out, but let us know how we can pray. Because I know that each of us has stuff, stuff going on in our lives that we may not have even spoken to anyone else, but sometimes it's good to get it out there and to invite someone else to pray for us. And this congregation takes very seriously those prayer requests that are made. Later, you'll have an opportunity during communion to bring them forward and to place those blue cards in the baskets, unless you're thinking about joining, and then we all say, keep a hold of them. And then at the close of the service, you can bring it to me or to one of our elders, and we will help that process along. I want to lift up that Tuesday evening, uh, there is the men's gathering. Uh, We'll gather at 6.30 for dinner out at Kramer Retreat Center. And study will begin at 7 o'clock. All the men are invited to come and to participate. Wednesday, I will be continuing my study around Paul's letters to the church at Corinth. I'll teach both at noon and at 6.30, so you're invited to come and participate. We started kind of a three-week sermon series, kind of introduction to Corinthians, last Sunday, and we'll continue through next Sunday. But my blog for about the next five and a half weeks is going to be on 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians each day. So I hope that between the study on Wednesday or the blog or these sermons that you will really spend some time in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. On Wednesday night, there is also uh, youth programming, there is dance, but I also want to lift up our Christian arts theater program for our elementary age children. There is still an opportunity to sign up this week, so let Tammy know. It has been a marvelous program, Um, but uh, those kids have to commit to it, and they put together, as they did this past fall, uh, a wonderful presentation that they shared with the congregation. Next Friday and Saturday is our elders and board retreat. The elders coming on Friday night, the board joining them uh, Saturday a little before lunch. If you are an elder for 2017 or a board member for 2017 and for some reason you did not get the information about that, let us know so that you can be a part of it. And finally, January 28th, SOAP, Saving Our Adolescents from Prostitution, a wonderful program. Teresa Flores is going to be coming in with a group of about 15 people from her ministry here to Cypress Creek in advance of that big football game that's coming to town. We are going to be on Saturday morning wrapping bars of soap, little individual bars of soap with the logo and the information about the national hotline for human trafficking. We're going to have lunch together and then we're going to go out in the community to different hotels and deliver those soaps. I hope that you will consider participating in this. This is something that we as a congregation need to get behind. And if you are looking for a way of making a difference, but you're not quite ready to make a long-term commitment. This is just a few hours on Saturday. And yet, let me suggest that if our work saves one child, it's worth it. It really is. So I hope that you will sign up. Uh, There is an opportunity out in the lobby to make sure your name is on that list and we know how many people to prepare for. Again, today we are continuing to look at Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. The very first chapter 
Last week, we looked at the opening verses, but now I turn to verses 9 through 13. I invite you to open up your spirits, to open up your minds, to hear these words. God is faithful, and you were called by Him to partnership with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored and be of the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in Paul's name? Those questions are important questions. But Paul doesn't just pose questions, but as we continue through this letter, we will, we will find answers as well. May God's goodness and grace be revealed to us now in these words. You join me in prayer. In this broken world, we look to you, Lord. We look to you for your redemptive and healing spirit. Speak to us provide us hope, mend the fractured pieces of our lives, for it is our desire to live as those who belong to you, our Creator and King. Amen. Have you ever been waiting for a message, opened it up, and discovered that it wasn't what you wanted? When my wife and I and our, our newborn child were living in the state of Missouri, we were waiting for an envelope to arrive in the mailbox. We were waiting for a refund check for our state income tax. That year, we had applied for a one-time tax credit for families that had adopted. It wasn't going to be much, but it was going to mean a, a refund. And even a little bit for a new family was something good. Well, the envelope came. We opened it. It included a letter, but no check. See, the state had set aside, according to the letter, a small amount of money for these tax credits. And we had not gotten to the pot early enough. So not only was there not a check in the envelope, and we were not getting the refund, because we were not getting the refund, it meant that we had to pay. And it was now after April 15th. And so we not only had to pay, but there was a penalty. When you receive something, open it up, and it's not what you expect it to be. It can be very deflating. Paul received word from his beloved church in Corinth, a community that he had worked with very closely. These were people that he knew so very well, and he wants to hear now a good word from them. He wants to hear about how his early efforts are paying off. But the message Paul received was about how the community was fighting, bickering, how they were arguing with one another, and they had broken into factions, people arrogantly claiming, our group is better than your group. It had to have been deflating for Paul to hear those words. Yet he sends back to the community in Corinth a letter, what we know as 1 Corinthians. And yes, as we learned last week, he begins with 
some very positive and affirming words, it doesn't take long for him to begin to dismantle what the community has turned into. He wants to dismantle their thinking and their approach so that he can rebuild something that is much more healthy. How often have we fallen into little factions, into little groups in the larger community? How many times have we defended those groups at the expense of the larger community? I mean, we do it when it comes to our sports. And for the most part, that's kind of a silly thing we do. We defend our team. But there are times in life where we see it playing as itself out in regard to race, education, social status, wealth, politics, even religion. Often the fears and insecurities we might feel have us seeking out these little groups within the community, seeking out these little like-minded groups that make us feel good about our insecurities and fears or help us maybe forget about them. It happens in the church all the time. And what happens in the life of the church when these little groups begin to emerge is that their thinking begins to overshadow and their commitment to what I would describe to be the fringe issues in the life of the church overshadow what is truly important. Not only do these feelings within us impact us, but there are those out there that are looking for individuals and groups that feel insecure because they desire to play on those insecurities. And that's what we saw happening in the life of the Corinthian church. They were splintering with different groups having allegiance to different leaders. And you can understand how that happens. A teacher feels flattered because the students are calling out the teacher's name. The students are hanging on every word the teacher might share. Our egos yearn for such recognition. So to maintain such praise and recognition, the teacher begins to create an us versus them world. What I'm teaching you, the message that I have and engage it is so much better than what you're hearing over there, what you're hearing among that group. The casualty, though, in all of this is the community, a community formed by love for the sake of love. I was a counselor at a middle school church camp and on the first full day, we had a two-hour break, and there was a group that wanted to play football. Well, Scott and I, two of the adults, were willing to lead that group, and we broke into two teams. It was Bruce's Badgers, and if I remember right, it was Scott's Snakes. Well, Bruce's Badgers crushed Scott's Snakes. And for the rest of the day, even at dinner time, they were chanting, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce. And I got to admit, it was kind of nice to hear. The next day, we went from the field to the court. And I am not the absolute worst basketball player in the history of the world, but if there was a top 25 worst players in the history of the world, I would be somewhere on the list. And our team was crushed on the basketball court. And all the praise went from Bruce to Scott for the rest of the day. By the third day, I was looking for another sport so that we could at least win two out of the three. Paul says to the church at Corinth, don't be divided by, by falling into rival gangs and groups. I hear you saying, I belong, I belong, I belong to Paul, I belong to Paulos, I belong to this person or that person. Don't you imagine that what was dividing the church at this time in Corinth, 
The factions that were being created were over probably things that were insignificant, inconsequential, even ridiculous. I was at this large church gathering. We broke up into small groups, and everybody in each small group came from different churches. We got acquainted by going around the circle and introducing ourselves and saying something that we liked about our church. One of the women in our group, probably mid-40s, told us that she went to the best church. That was nice to hear somebody say that, to have that kind of strong feeling. But she continued to press it, that her church was the best. And so somebody asked, why is that? Because my minister, my minister's words are wonderful. Somebody said, well, I think my minister's words are wonderful too. No, she said, my minister's words are really wonderful. And then she explained why. And I kid you not, she said, it's because my minister has a beard. And Jesus had a beard. And when I look at my minister's face, it is as if Jesus is speaking to me. For 18 months, I didn't have a beard. I had a goatee. Was my preaching better during that time? The church and groups within the church throughout its history have gotten haughty and arrogant and smug over what our denominational founders described as the non-essentials. We split, we divide, we ridicule and fight over what our insecurities and anxieties and fears have tried to define as important. But all the time, what we are doing is we are tossing love under the bus. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, you were called by God as partners with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This idea of partnership, or it can be defined as commu in community with or in fellowship with, the word is koinonia in the Greek. And it's interesting how many churches in, in recent years called their fellowship hall, koinonia hall. But the word koinonia is more than just a place where people come together. It describes those who are bound together by a purpose and for the sake of a purpose. And this purpose is not about those non-essentials that so often consume the thinking and the life of the church and lead to division. No, instead, that purpose is the essential, love. Paul writes to the church, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. Be restored. This morning, I want to suggest three practical, I hope, simple practices that we can do to restore us, to restore us to that same mind, that same purpose, which is Jesus. The first thing you can do is get some sleep. The scriptures say that we are to take Sabbath rest that we are to take the Sabbath seriously. In the story of creation found in, first, in, in Genesis 1, what does God do? On the seventh day, God takes a rest. I appreciated the guy who said, the scriptures say that we are to make the Sabbath holy. I instead, the man said, make the Sabbath hectic. I see this open day and I cram it full with as much stuff as I can and I get to the end of the Sabbath and can't wait for Monday morning to go back to work and slow down a little bit. There are studies that have been done on the human brain that say that the part of the brain where we store our positive memories and stories is that part of the brain that is most affected by exhaustion where the part of our brain that it stores the memories that are negative, it's not hindered as much by exhaustion. 
And so when we are tired, what part of the brain do we go to? We go to that part that has the negative memories and stories, those things that feed our insecurities and our fears, that draw us into those little cliques and groups that end up dividing the church and divide community. We need to get some sleep. And if you got a cat nap during this sermon for five minutes, God bless you. We need more sleep. Along with sleep, we need to smile a little bit more. In Proverbs 15, 13, it says, a happy heart makes the face cheerful. Well, might I suggest that the reverse is true as well, that a cheerful face can make the heart happy. The act of smiling, just the physical act, you may not even really feel happy inside, but the physical act, the muscles, they trigger in the brain the release of certain endorphins that make us feel a little more happy, but it also brings a sense of calm. And you are better able to make decisions. A study was done on those who were prone to judging other human beings, but they were asked to intentionally smile as often as they could. And what was discovered in the study is those that were prone to judging others, if they smiled at them, they were more likely to find something good in that person than they were able to find something to judge. We need to sleep. We need to smile. And then seriously, folks, we need to not take ourselves so seriously. The Apostle Paul said, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short of the glory of God. When we can't laugh at our mistakes, when we try to hide our shortcomings, when we try to look flawless and pretend that sin never touches our lives, what happens is that we are living this false life. And we begin to seek out little groups that will help us hide from all of that stuff. And we will find groups that are quick to judge others, lifting up our best points while pointing out the worst in others. We are drawn to these groups because what they do is they expose and attack what we perceive as inadequacies in others in hopes that others won't see the inadequacies within us. We need to not take ourselves so seriously. We need to laugh a little. I mean, in those moments where you stumble in some way and try to do the whole thing like I meant to do that, no. We need to just sit back and laugh and tell the story and be as human as we can. Because there's something in that moment that allows us to depend more fully on grace and not about our ability to look good or look perfect. So in the next four weeks, I want to challenge you to get more sleep, to smile a little more, and to not take yourselves so seriously. Get some more sleep. If you're doing a, a binge watch of The Walking Dead, watch one less episode and go to bed a little earlier. Smile at people and be intentional about smiling at people. Be preemptive with your smile. Get to the point that people are wondering what it is that's making you smile all the time. And serious folks, don't take yourselves so seriously. A little bit of self-deprecating humor might just be good for us all. I have never heard anyone at this church say, I belong to Bruce. That's a good thing, because you don't belong to me. You and I belong to Christ. And we are bound to him in this koinonia, bound by a purpose and for the sake of a purpose, and that purpose is love.
And if we are bound not to some faction, some group that pretends that they are something that they are not, if we are bound to the one who is love, we have a better chance of fulfilling the purpose that is love. Because then we will be community. Then we will be the body of Christ. Not only in this moment, not only in this community, but for the sake of of the world. You join me in prayer. Lord God, by your gift of love and for the sake of love, we seek to come together, not around our insecurities and fears that, that others will prey upon, but around the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, and unite us. Unite our work here at Cypress Creek Christian Church let us find ways of strengthening our relationships with one another, our relationships that should be rooted in your gift of love, a gift that was given for the purpose of sharing. If it requires us getting a little more sleep, smiling a bit more often, or just laughing, even laughing at ourselves and our mistake, help us to do so. For Jesus has shown what the body of Christ can be and do, assuming it is one in the essential that is love. Where the church universal is still divided, where denominations arrogantly claim righteousness over others, forgive us, merciful God, and teach us. Teach us the ways of love, which include humility and kindness, compassion, peacefulness, and understanding. Let us not be distracted by the non-essentials at the expense of what is truly essential. Let us find unity and love, a love that can that can eclipse what otherwise would divide. Oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for moments like this where we can be bound together through your love and through your spirit, be bound together not by our own doing, but by your power. May we come together so that we can be the people of love, so that our community better understands the power of that love. We offer this prayer in the name of the one who is love, Jesus Christ. Amen.